Thank you. Can everybody hear? Okay. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure for me to come uh, to the Reagan Ranch Center. Um, I worked with Ron Robinson and, uh, for 25 years and uh, with Patrick for a very long time. <laughs> uh, I think that YAF, the Young America's Foundation, is one of the most important institutions uh, on the right, and that means one of the most important institutions defending this country. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm also happy to be with all you young people. Um, I have a granddaughter who's older than all of you. <laughs> Actually, I have several. Um, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I believe that the fate of this country is going to be determined in your lifetimes, and that's a big responsibility for all of you. You are headed now, uh, some of you, some of you have got another year or two in high school, but you're headed to um, the university. And that means you're going to institutions which, if they're public institutions, state institutions, if they're elite uh, colleges, uh, uh, in fact, if they're like anywhere's about 90% of them, you're going into left-wing institutions. Please don't call them liberals. Patrick has asked me to talk about words. Words are really important. Um, those of you who have uh, stood up for your conservative views in high school know that um, these people do not like to hear conservative views um, and will try to shut you down. No, no liberal, no self-respecting liberal would do that. Um, so don't call them liberals. They're leftists. I, um, I thought a lot about how, how to try to give you some advice and prepare you uh, for college. One piece of advice that I always give to students and I give particularly to worried parents who's sending their kids off to college and are afraid of losing them is to stay connected with the conservative movement. And that means an organization like YAF. Um, that will keep you sane, uh, and it will also keep you connected to ideas um, that reflect the values with which you were brought up, and the values which created this country and made it great. You, you, we see before us this fight over Obamacare, over the debt ceiling, and so forth. And so you know that there's a huge divide in this country, but huge. It's never, in my lifetime, it's never been so great. Uh, where people are, they're like on different planets, people on the left and the right. And the issues that divide them are, of course, the way you see them, they're policy issues. Should we, you know, increase government spending or decrease it? Uh, is big government a good thing or not a good thing? But there are much more profound issues at, at the heart of it. And so I want to I, I address what is the central question that divides people and has divided them for hundreds of years. And that is this. What is the source of the problems that we see? What is the source of the... Why is it that some people... Uh, have more money and other people have less money. What is the source of the failures of certain communities, of some communities to achieve and some to succeed? The answer to this question is what creates conservatives and what I will call leftists, socialists, radicals. People on the left believe that the source of our problems is society, social institutions. The founder of the, how many of you have ever heard of Jean-Jacques Rousseau? Oh, that, very educated people here, that's good. Rousseau famously said in the social contract that man is born free but is everywhere in chains. Rousseau believed that society 
was the cause that people in a state of nature are naturally good. They get along, they're harmonious. When they get into society, they learn to look down on each other, to fight. They, uh, they become greedy. They, they want to uh, acquire things that other people don't have and deny people. Man is born free, but everywhere in chains. It, it should be obvious to anybody, but it's not, that this is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous statement. A baby is not free. It's totally dependent. We, uh, you are all old enough to know, we all have uh, appetites, lusts, tendencies um, <clears throat> that we have to control. Otherwise, we wouldn't have laws. We wouldn't have morality. What is morality for? Morality is to discipline you from not following all your animal instincts or your, uh, and, and becoming a civilized person. People aren't born civilized. They have to be made that way. What conservatives understand is that the source of our problems is us. If you're church going, you'll hear that every Sunday or Saturday. It's us. We're the problem. Think of, uh, I'm an agnostic, but I understand that a book like the Bible has been around as long as it has because there's wisdom in it. And you know, people don't read. Uh, over 2,000 years, a book, or whatever it is, three, 4,000 years, a book that doesn't have wisdom. Think of the story of Genesis. Adam and Eve uh, were given paradise. It's better, than, so it's better than anything that Nancy Pelosi promises. The Garden of Eden. They didn't have to work. There was no pain. They lived forever. Plucked the fruit from the trees, but... There was one rule, and that is, do not eat of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that tree. When our foreparents were too ornery to obey that law. And so they were expelled from the garden. And God put a flaming, an angel with a flaming sword at the entrance to Eden. This is a, a very important parable for understanding where we are. A fl an angel with a flaming sword to prevent human beings from returning to Eden. Only by a divine hand could we return. The whole agenda of the left is to return us to Eden. That's what the agenda is. We're going to have a world, there's going to be no racism, there's going to be no sexism, there's I hate that word, but anyway, no sexism, there's going to be no poverty, there's going to be no war. That's paradise. That's the kingdom of heaven on earth. Now, if you believe that you can get there by changing social institutions, if, if you're a conservative, you understand that because we're the problem, you, you have to have laws when, during the 60s, we radicals said, we, you know, we don't need police. Police are only there to guard property. That was the big idea at Woodstock. How many people have ever heard of Woodstock? Oh, wow, amazing. Um, but of course, there were, uh, that was a delusional even then. There were all these bad drug trips at, at Woodstock. But it was followed by Altamont, how many people have ever heard of Altamont? Oh, that's, I can see you all have left-wing teachers. Because Altamont was another big concert. It was 69 as opposed to 68, 1969. Um, and the Rolling Stones uh, gave this concert and they hired the Hells Angels, uh, who were meth dealers, um, to be the security. And they killed a black, a black man. They beat him to death with a pool cue, with pool cues. And for those of us who had the delusions then, that was a big chastening event. You do need police. 
they're bad people. Evil, evil is all around us. If you're a progressive, if you're a leftist, if you're a Democrat, um, you tend to uh, either ignore that or way downplay it. That's why so-called liberal judges are always letting these criminals out because they didn't have a chance. I mean, where the um, Les Mis, how many people have seen Les Mis? Oh, you know. Okay, well, that's a left-wing saga of, uh, about a, a man who was punished because he stole a loaf of bread because he was hungry. You don't have to steal a loaf of bread if you're hungry in this country. You, got, you know, get your EBT card or your, and your food stamps. When people steal, when they hurt other people, when they're criminals, there's something evil in them that makes them do it. If you believe, however, that social, you just have to change social institutions, or just give people enough money, just more handouts, um, We'll just open the doors of uh, universities, whether they're qualified or not. Uh, then we're going to have this brave new world. That's, that's the left-wing viewpoint. But if you believe that, think. Then you can change social institutions and bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth. Well, what follows from that? What follows from that is that people who think this idea isn't going to work and bad consequences may follow from it and therefore they oppose it, those people are evil. That's us, we conservatives. If you ever noticed, well, liberals, so-called, progressives, leftists, they're always interrupting conservatives and they're always shouting over them. And if you put up posters in their schools that they don't like, they tear them down. Why is that? Because the only thing that's preventing us from getting to the kingdom of heaven is these bad ideas that conservatives had. That's what you're going to run up against in, in, in school. Don't expect. There are decent people who don't have our views, but they're a dwindling lot. Most of them will be so upset by conservative views that they will want to shut you up and then punish you. you have, the only thing you have going for yourself is that you're young and if they have any decency left in them, they'll, they, they will to some extent respect that. Although I've heard enough stories, I've met with some of you before the speech, and I, I would no surprise to me to know that the level of decency has diminished tremendously since I was young. When I went to school, I never knew, and that's from elementary school through graduate school, never once heard a professor make a political statement in class. Never once. Didn't know, you know what my professor's point of view was. And that was lucky for me, because I went to school in the McCarthy era, and um, my parents were communists. And I was writing Marxist papers. And I've often looked back on my experience and wondered what would have happened to me if in the middle of a class one of my professors had said, Horowitz, why don't you explain to the rest of the class why communists like to kill people? That would have polarized me against my professor and it would have deprived me of a teacher. I, I think one of the most shameful things that's been done in the last 50 years or 30 years is to destroy our educational system and turn it into a political recruitment uh, operation. Now, we're on uh, a path towards that. We're not exactly there yet. How many of you have heard, so one of the things that follows from people who want to change the world by changing social institutions is that they want to destroy freedom. They don't want dissenters. I urged the students I met with to read a book about communism because that's the end game there. The people who created communism were not stupid people. And actually, that were, some of them were quite brilliant, leaders of the Russian Revolution. But they had no idea what they were unleashing. They thought they were doing it all for good 
for the good of the people. And that led them to create a monstrous regime, the most oppressive regime in human history. They killed, communists killed over 100 million people, not in war, in peace. Why? Because when you set about to create a new world where everybody is equal, uh, you know, everybody is accepted, and so forth and so on, there's no, uh, there's not going to be any poverty and so forth. When you set out to do that, it is such a beautiful idea that you will justify any crime to get there. And that's what happened. How many of you have heard the phrase uh, social construction of gender or race? Few, oh my God. All right, you're going to hear a lot of this when you get to college. The social construction of gender and race. This is the insane idea. <laughs> I'll, I'll do gender. The insane idea that masculinity and femininity characteristics that separate men from women, uh, or, or give them different characters, <laughs> uh, is imposed by capitalist society. That actually, people are born pretty much the same. I mean, we have different um, organs or whatever we have that make us different, but you know, everything else is the same. Trust me, if you fall for this, if you let them seduce you into these ideas, you will be asking for a lot of grief over the years as you try to relate to the other gender. <laughs> Men and women are really different. <laughs> However, that's what's taught in every women's studies program in the country. The social construction of race, the social construction of gender. It's always society is to blame for anything that makes uh, these people uh, uncomfortable. Society is to blame. You can see it in the, um, what's called affirmative action programs, although now they have a better one, uh, inclusive excellence it's called, where admission standards of universities are rigged to let certain designated groups, not minorities, because it doesn't apply to Asians and it doesn't, it doesn't apply to Sri Lankans, but certain designated groups, designated by the left, are admitted to schools without having the test scores that would qualify them to enter. Now, there are exceptional people always. And there are exceptional members of minority groups that this doesn't hurt. But most of the minorities who are taken into universities, and there are now books on this. One book is called Academic Mismatch. What happens is, at some point in time, reality hit. First, the first thing that happens is you take very bright students from a minority group and you place them above their level. Uh, instead of going to, say, a state school, um, they go to MIT. So Thomas Sowell, how many of you know the name Thomas Sowell? Well, oh, that's good, that's good. You should all read Thomas Sowell, S-O-W-E-L-L. -L. Thomas Sowell wrote a paper once uh, and said that under affirmative action, the top 1% of black students are admitted to uh, schools like MIT. But when they get to MIT, they're in the bottom 10% of the class. So you take very bright students who could succeed, and you all are aware of, of your peers. I mean, I, I know this personally because I, 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 I had an uncle who taught at music and art high school. So I went to music and art. And I, I could play the piano and the clarinet, but I was not a, I didn't have the, 
the talent that these other kids did. I mean, these kids were geniuses. I mean, I went there and, you know, kids would, uh, if you hummed a tune, they would come in, they would play the whole thing like they had a score in front of them. Um, they had perfect pitch. They had, you know, and I got very discouraged and I like, left after the first year and went, um, I, you know, I went to my local high school. So I know how you can get discouraged if the competition is too intense. You take these kids who are at a certain level and you put them above their level and it's, it's discouragement. So the dropout rates, the fail rates are huge among these minority students. And when they get to, if they ever get their degrees, and this is true in law schools, I mean the studies have been done um, across the board. Uh, and that's because the left wants to make the institution, will rig the institutions and that will fix the problem. That won't fix the problem because the problem is much deeper and if you, we, it goes back, as conservatives we understand the problem is with us, with the individuals. We believe in individual freedom. We don't believe in, in groups getting rights that other groups don't have, which is the case now in this country. When Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement, it was for e equality under the law. Now we have racial, race-specific laws again. When I was a kid, the race-specific laws were in the South. The North did not have them. And what the civil rights struggle was about was to end segregation in the South, different laws for different races. Now we have it. If you are from Sri Lanka, you have very dark skin, but you don't qualify for affirmative action places. That's a race law. White kids have to, you know, perform way above what Hispanic kids, black kids, Pacific Islanders, and so forth have to perform. So it creates resentments on both sides. It creates inferiority feelings on the minorities in particular who suffer the most. As a conservative, whenever you're faced in the class and people are telling you that it's society that does it, which is what they will tell you, you just look for that. Um, do women earn less than men? You hear every demo from Bill Clinton, Hillary, they all say it. Women earn how much on the dollar? 70? 72 cents on the dollar to men. Now, you know there's something wrong with that statistic, don't you? Because if it were true, if women earn 70 cents on the dollar to what a man earned for the same work, with the same skills, with the same experience, then smart capitalists would fire their male employees, hire women, and increase their profits 30%. <laughs> and I, I have to tell you, I am still shocked at the level of lying in our public life. The lies are just all over the place. You have to be, you, you have to be diligent uh, and do the research yourself. The difference between the income gap between men and women, which has nothing to do with sexism and discrimination against women. It has to do with several factors. One is that women bear children. And, you know, I've had quite a few children myself. I will tell you that the, the maternal instinct is very powerful for most women, not all, but for most women. Um, and women don't want, when they have a little kid, a little baby, they feel very protective and they want to nurture it. And so they take themselves out of the labor force for years. That's one of the sources of the gap. Um, they look for jobs where there's flex time so they can get off and take care of their kids. That's just the reality. That's where the difference comes in. Um, 
If you look at poverty rates or <coughs> crime rates, you can see, I mean, the black community in America, I mean, the, the, the thing that nobody wants to talk about, or at least people on the left don't want to talk about, is the tremendous, the tremendous revolution for black people since like 1940. In 1940, 4% of uh, African Americans were professionals. Now, over 50% of the African American community is in the middle class, but there's a huge, a huge portion of that community that is poor and that is crime ridden. 50% of the violent crimes in America are committed by blacks. They're only 12% of the population. Why, why, why is there so much black poverty? Well, if you look again at the statistics, if you're looking to, you have to look to the individual lives, not to the social institutions. You look at the in individual lives. If you are raised in a single parent family, single parent household, you are six times, actually it's five and a half times, more likely to be poor than if you're raised in a two parent household. And this is not a revelation for conservatives. There's a lot of conservative literature on this. 75% of the black community of children are born out of wedlock. Now, there was a social institution factor in that because in the 60s, 75% of black children were born to two parents. So why is it only 25% today? Well, it has a lot to do with the Democratic Party and the left and the welfare system they put in place which drove men out of the home. I'm just trying to give you here a way to look at it to understand how your views as a conservative, which look to individuals and try to understand the particular circumstances which may have effect on, on groups as this one does. Um, so that when you're faced in your classroom with the teachers, are, you know, the, the left is very good at putting together a case. And they will put a, you know, and they'll say, well, look at this disparity uh, between blacks and whites on, uh, you know, in poverty or in, in incarceration. Why are there so many blacks in prison? Because so many blacks commit crimes. And who do they commit the crimes against? They commit them against other blacks. Yet, if you're in a class, you're going to be told that that disparity is evidence of institutional racism. That's a, word, that's a phrase. How many have heard that phrase? That's too bad. That's a complete myth. There is no such thing as institutional racism. I mean, well, you know, the uh, Asians are not especially wealthy, particularly Vietnamese immigrants and so forth. They do very well. They do very well on tests, and they get out of poverty. It's a culture. It's a cultural difference. And the culture is partly induced by the political by the political system. I actually, I wrote down, because Patrick made me, I'm gonna try to think of the, oh, I know, this is the last thing really I wanna talk about. People on the left, Democrats, progressives, communists, and so-called liberals, They're always talking about equality. If there's a disparity, that's because of institutional racism or that's because of institutional oppression of one kind or another. No, it's not. You have to look at the individuals, at the performances. You have to break it down. As I say, there's a vast conservative literature that you guys will become familiar with. Um, and one of the ways is through uh, organizations like, like this one. But you need to, you really need to educate yourself because your teachers 
are going to be on the other side of this equation. For them, it's all about equality. Everybody should be equal. Um, the founders of this country had a different idea. The idea was equal before the law, equal in the eyes of God. This country was founded by Protestants and had to be. The ideas of the Declaration, which is the birth document, that all men are created equal, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is the liberating idea. The idea is that we all have a, a immortal souls, and so we're equal in the eyes of God, and therefore government cannot take away the rights that God has given. There is no way to create our democracy except by God-fearing people. And as I said, I'm an agnostic, but I understand that. Because if government gives you the rights, government can take them away. Equal in the eyes of the law. Not equal to get into Harvard. Not equal to be in the NBA or, 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 or the major leagues. Not equal. Not inclusive excellence. There are no institutional barriers to excellence. Not in 2013 in this country. The admissions offices of universities are not filled with racists trying to keep black kids and Hispanic kids out. In fact, they're dying to get them in. They will bribe them to get them in. And they will do things that are damaging to those kids, but they'll put them in you see Santa Barbara when they should be at uh, Cal State Fullerton or whatever, where they're qualified to be and where they could achieve and realize their potential and make up whatever deficiencies they have because they didn't come from a two-parent home or, or, or didn't have books on the shelves or were told that uh, intellectual uh, ideas, are that's thinking white. Studying hard is thinking white. But the founders understood this, too, that there is a conflict, an indissoluble conflict between equality and liberty, which I'm going to call freedom, a little bit loose conceptually, but freedom. Because I want you to understand what you are fighting for, and you'll be fighting for it for the rest of your lives. In Federalist 10, Federalist Paper Number 10, which was written by Madison, this is spelled out. And it's spelled out in a footnote. He says, in order to, since people are not born equal, and all of you know this, you should know it from the time you're five years old unless you've been brainwashed, which an awful lot of people have been, we're not equal. Some of us are more talented than others. Some of us are prettier or handsomer than others. Some, some of us, you know, I speak, speak from my vantage, taller than others. That gives you certain advantages. Some of us have more energy. Some of us have better personalities. All of these things translate into, um, or brains, what about brain power? Translate into, into money, resources. That's where the inequality comes from. Individual talent, individual achievement. So in order to make everybody equal, redistributing income, which is what our Marxist president wants us to do, in order to do that, you have to take away some, what somebody else has a right to, has earned. Take away their freedom. The battle is between what I will call communists who want to equalize everything through the power of the state and people who love freedom and will fight for individual freedom. That's the battle you are going to face your entire lifetimes and this country will face. And right now we're losing the battle 
losing it big time. So, boy, I hope to end it on a happier note than that, but you know, um, <laughs> that's where we are. And knowing where you are is the first step uh, in, in be a, being able to cope with it and actually, hopefully, you will win this battle for all of us. Oh, I won't be around to see it, but I'm counting on you to do it. Thank you, and uh, I'll take questions. Don't be intimidated. Hi, my name is Claire Marks, and I'm from Sacramento. And um, you were saying that um, we're losing the battle right now. How do you suggest um, us going around to winning the battle? Yeah, I sort of thought, I, I wrote a little pamphlet called Go for the Heart. Um, by the way, this little booklet, um, Barack Obama's Rules for Revolution, will is give you a dose of what the other side, how they think. Um, I actually, uh, I, I think Gaff is doing uh, some of this already. Um, and I would say is the first conservative organization to really do this. You have to go after, you have to confront the left. You have to not be intimidated by them. And confront them with their hypocrisies and with the way in which they hurt the very people they are claiming to help. Democrats don't give a damn about black people. Every inner city in America of any size, Detroit, Philadelphia, Chicago, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Washington, D.C., Every one of them is 100% controlled by the Democratic Party and has been for 50 to 100 years. Everything that's wrong with the inner cities in America, Democrats are responsible for, and Republicans are too polite to mention. That's what you guys got to change. You just look at what they do to women, you look at what they do to blacks, you look at what they do to poor people. They're happy to put everybody on food stamps, to have everybody living, to give $200 a child to women who have six and seven children so they can collect their checks, so that all those kids will live in poverty forever. It's evil what the Democratic Party is doing, and it's shameful what the Republican Party is not doing, to the point of being criminal, in my view. Although I try to keep unity on the right and don't, don't like to attack Republicans. Too polite to mention it, that, that's the way I phrase it. So I wrote a whole pamphlet, I should have brought it, it's called Go for the Heart. You can get it right off, if you go to gofortheheart.org, um, on the internet you can get it right off there. Or you can call my office Tell them David said you can have a copy and they'll send it to you. Uh, my name is Christian Lingner and I'm from Arkansas. And uh, earlier you were talking about how the uh, leftists, they'll say that um, gender, about talking about gender and racial transformation, is that what you called it? Construction, social construction, um, construction of race construction, and gender. Yes. That um, society blame. creates Race is a, is a, actually, they actually say this, is socially created. There's okay. no such thing as race. Well, of course there is. But, you know, this is cloud cuckoo land. <laughs> we're, we're with them, but, you know. Um, but you said they blame that on capitalism? Um, yeah, because the capitalists want to divide and conquer. So they divide people into races. Okay. in order to make them weak, so they set them against each other. You don't have to set people against each other. What you have to do is try to prevent them from being set against each other. You put two one-year-olds in a room with a bunch of toys and close the door. 
I guarantee you, very shortly, there'll be screams coming from that room as they fight over the toys. Nobody taught them to do it. <laughs> There's actually a uh, fairly good book by a, uh, a, uh, somebody who's uh, on the left, but is a, he's a neurosci neuroscience, by the way, which is about the biological hardwiring of people, of gender traits, of intelligence, and so forth. Um, they have the facts. Anyway, the book is called The Blank Slate by Steven Pinker. Um, the people of the left, the Rousseaus, they believe that you're born with a blank slate and that society then imprints on it. No, you're not. <laughs> I know, but you know. I have like, I don't know. I've had a lot of dogs, and they're all different. They all have different personalities, even if they're raised in the same household, different personalities. I mean, you know, same thing with kids. They're just born different. It's inborn. My name's Lily. I'm from um, around the Seattle area in Washington. And I'm just curious to know, because um, you've been saying a lot about like leftists and Democrats and liberals, do you completely disagree with everything they've ever said or ever done? Or is there anything you can name right now that you do That's agree a, with? I, 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 I'd I, like to know, just out of curiosity. I mean, is there a liberal with a decent idea? <laughs> well, I want to know if you actually like wholeheartedly agree with anything that they do or say or anything. Of course. I believe it's really important to have have two, a two-party system. I believe it's very important to have the two, the two sides. Um, it's, you know, first of all, most problems do not have easy, simple solutions because human beings are very complex and in their perversity as, and in, in, in other ways. So, you know, I had this, you know, I have this argument, uh, uh, or had this argument with my daughter. Um, you know, like, take, ca take capital punishment. Um, there are problems with capital punishment. There are also problems with letting killers, you know, even live out their lives in jail. It's really unfair to the lives that they've destroyed of all the, you know, people who love the the, the victim. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. I like to hear, um, you know, when I'm being really hard-nosed, I like to hear some, somebody with a softer view and try to balance it out. So, yeah. The problem is that politically we've reached a point. It used to be a two-party system. When I was a young man, there, was, there were two parties. The party had a left wing, both parties had a left wing and a right wing and a center. And they would argue it out, they would go to the conventions and argue it out. And then they'd come up with fairly similar candidates and people would complain that it was Tweedledum and Tweedledee, that there was no difference between the parties. That was a very good thing. It meant for stability, it meant that all these things were ironed out and not, and okay. Now we have a primary system. In the old days, you w went to the conventions and the party workers, the people who were you know, party a activists, they decided who would be the best candidate to win. These were politi political insiders. Um, I had a very funny experience. I, when I was doing uh, research on the biography of the Kennedys, I interviewed Mike Prendergast, who was a Missouri boss. Democrat Party boss. And, uh, you know, we got talking about the old smoke filled rooms where they made these decisions. Um, and he said, Yeah, he said, we knew what a president should look like in my day. He said, We wouldn't have let Jimmy Carter on the back of the bus. Anyway, that was an amusing anecdote to me at least. <laughs> um, What's happened, though, is that, okay, you have the primary systems now, so 
the primaries, the, the people who are involved in the primaries, the voters, are, tend to be on the left and the right of their parties. So uh, immediately, and then, uh, you know, if you watch a, uh, an election campaign, there's all these lying ads that everybody puts out that are very effective, by the way. Uh, so it's, it's kind of the worst possible situation, but it tends to polarize. And there's been a, a polarization of the two parties since, since the McGovern candidacy. The Democratic Party started this and moved far to the left, and the Republican Party has gradually moved to the right as a result. So right now, when you're talking to the Democrat, when you're talking to the Democratic Party, first of all, they speak with one voice. Did you know, you know, with Republicans, there's always a crew that will, whatever, want to compromise, want to negotiate, whatever it is. With the Democrats, they, they, they talk, that they have the same talking points, they say the same phrases, and they're in lockstep. So right now, I think, you know, we're, there's, it's, it's a, almost a, it's a no man's land in the, in the middle. I always feel sorry for the guys that I, 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 who, who get up there. I mean, you know, it's, usually it's McCain and somebody, but saying, you know, why can't we all get along? Uh, we, we all need to get along and tone down the rhetoric and so forth. But it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for a long time, unfortunately. I think we're in a very bad state in this country. So I don't know if that answers your question. I believe there should be, always be a left and a right a view that says people are really good at heart, and a view that says, no, they're not. Because there are good people. And you never know in a particular situation what you're dealing with. And you do want to give people a second chance. But not everybody. Because some people you give a second chance and they go out and they murder somebody. So there's no easy, there are no easy answers. <laughs> what I, what I find most offensive is the professors that you're going to encounter because if there ever was a place where there should be a plurality of views, where ideas should be examined from all different sides, it's a university, it's a school, but particularly a university. And that they've just purged the universities of conservatives. They're, all, they're rarer than unicorns on faculties. Okay. Okay. All right. 